My friend Rob Little founded Cairn in early 2014, guiding the company through seven years of strategy, growth, and fundraising prior to leading the company through an acquisition by Outside in 2021. Before starting Cairn, Rob worked as an engineer for Lockheed Martin and spent two years as a Peace Corps volunteer in Latin America. During his free time, Rob can be found backpacking, skiing, biking, and paddleboarding with friends, his wife Betsy, daughters Kennedy and Brooklyn, and their Cairn Terrier Rocco. Tell me more, Rob. Here to deliver Outside's acquisition of Cairn, the story and their future, is Outside Senior Director, Commerce Operations, and former co-founder and co-CEO at Cairn, Mr. Rob Little. Come on up, Rob. Thanks for the intro and for the invitation. Uh, Dave, you're amazing. Uh, I don't know Eddie Vedder. Anyone looking for... Uh, no Eddie Vedder stories here, but uh, Dave, you're an inspiration. I love what you're building. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you to the Edco team for the, for the invitation. Uh, it's hard for me to believe that in two months, we'll mark eight years since I first took the stage at a pub talk event uh, where I pitched the original idea for Karen. We were in the second month of our business. As preparation for this, I went back and I looked at my notes for what we pitched eight years ago, what I pitched eight years ago. And uh, I was very proud on the stage to announce that the month before, our first month, we had opened and shipped 30 boxes around the country. That month, the month we were pitching, we had doubled that number and, and were shipping 70 boxes around the country. Uh, I made a comment that my mother only bought one of those boxes. Uh, here we are eight years later. Uh, we've shipped just over three million products around the country and the globe. Uh, we've, we've, thanks. Uh, we've collected uh, not quite one million product reviews. We're one of the largest product review collectors in the outdoor and recreation industry. Um, and my mother has hardly made a dent in those sales. So, still true today. Uh, it's been uh, a wild ride over the last eight years, and my hope this evening is to share the ups and downs with you, um, some of the highs and lows over the course of that experience. Also share with you the, the story of our acquisition. Uh, we were acquired not quite a year ago by Outside. Uh, that might invoke uh, an image of a magazine that you've seen on a newsstand or in an airport somewhere. Uh, we weren't bought by the Legacy Magazine Company. I'll tell you more about that story in just a minute. Um, uh, but first, for those of you that weren't familiar with our business, uh, who was Cairn? What was Cairn? Uh, my business partner, Jared, and I, Aaron wants me to hold this even closer. Is that better, Aaron? Uh, what, what was Cairn? What is Cairn? So my business partner, Jared, and I started, uh, started this venture with the objective to create a creative commerce company for the outdoor industry. What does that mean? Well, the, the commerce world is changing. That's not news to anyone. It started changing two decades ago. Brick and mortar ruled for a long time. And then came along the internet. And with the internet brought a commoditized commerce experience. Uh, it was all driven by convenience and economics. Uh, how fast can I get something and how cheap can I get it? And clearly Amazon has won that battle. Uh, but for every consumer, it's our belief that there exists a category that you want more than just a commoditized experience. It's not about how fast or how cheap can I get something. You have a passion in your life that you want to experience a different commerce experience through. Uh, for some, it's art. For some, it's clothing, apparel. It's cosmetics. For my wife, it's horseback riding. For me, it's the outdoors and recreation. I don't look for those products on Amazon. I want a different experience when I'm buying them. Uh, ten years ago, there were a number of businesses that were starting to embark on creating a different relationship between consumers and brands. Uh, Stitch Fix, Trunk Club, Rent the Runway, Warby Parker, Casper, Away Luggage. These companies were all on an inflection point of something new and unique in the retail industry that wasn't a commoditized experience. And as Jared and I looked at the industry of retail and the models, we couldn't see a single example in the outdoor or the recreational industry. And it was our objective to try and find the right model to bring to an industry that we were passionate about to change how, co how customers buy products. Uh, the, uh, as, we, as we looked over the course of that, that industry, what we discovered was that 
subscription would be a really good way to create community and to build a quickly growing business. This concept of of the month club was interesting to us, but also a little odd and not quite what we wanted to stake our entire future on. Um, one thing though that we realized as we were exploring the industry and the concepts of what sort of a, a retail business to start was that uh, potentially data could change the background of the business. Since there's a Trojan horse built into the entire business model around product reviews. We all know the enthusiastic outdoors man or woman who's interested in just sharing their love for their tent or their jacket or their surfboard, whatever it is they recently brought. And trying to get that information is not hard. Um, could we mine it for, uh, for data that could then lead the business down uh, a future road or future opportunities? That was our objective. Um, fast forward eight years, the subscription model is the biggest component of what we built. It still is today. Uh, we tried and tested many things along the way. Uh, we had a try before you buy pro uh, product, very similar to what Stitch Fix offers. We had a, an auction offering, a reverse Dutch, Dutch auction offering um, that was value driven. We had a gear recycling program, all of which were building momentum as we um, entered into COVID and uh, sort of an unknown era for us. Um, COVID hit and we hunkered down. We weren't sure what to expect. Um, we're a vitamin, we're not a prescription. People didn't need what we did or what we sold. Um, uh, we were worried the economy could fall out and um, it could be the end of our business. So what we discovered was actually the opposite. Uh, COVID injected growth into our model. We were outdoor, we were recreational, we were direct to consumer. All of those elements thrived at the beginning of COVID. Um, we had uh, an individual who came across our business at the start of that. Actually, forgive me, there's some highs and lows over the course of that experience um, before I get into the transaction. Um, there were a lot of highs. Uh, there were some tremendous highs. So first, uh, you all, Bend, this community. Uh, what an inspiration and what a welcoming place to start a business. I think I could stand up here for the 20 minutes that I'm given and just speak to all of the walks, the beers, the coffees, the meals that I was given by many of you in this room uh, and many that have, have moved on and the inspiration you provided to an early business owner. Uh, I would gladly start this business all over again here in Bend. It's a special place that we have and you guys love your entrepreneurs. Thank you for that. An another high, uh, riding the wave of big growth in business. Uh, wow, is it an inspiration. Uh, three years in, uh, we qualified to apply for the Forbes uh, Fastest Growing Business Awards. Uh, some of you have probably seen them on newsstands before. Um, the way, at least in 2017, they ran them is they took the previous three years' growth and they measured it as a percentage. How fast did you grow over those three years and they rank you? Uh, we were excited to apply three years into our business. Um, there's a nuance in how you apply. You have to have $100,000 in revenue for your first year in business. We had a little over 100000 in booked revenue. We had a little less than 100000 in earned revenue. I'm guessing there's an accountant or two in the room that's perking up and really excited right now at those terms. I'll leave it to them to explain later to anybody that's curious what those mean. Uh, they'll probably go off on a tangent about the airline industry when they do. Uh, it turns out that Forbes only cares about earned revenue. They don't care about booked revenue. So we were disqualified from the 2017 awards. When the actual awards came out, I went and looked and I filtered through and I ran our numbers and we were the 22nd fastest growing company in the country, private company in the country in 2017 riding that wave and experiencing how quickly a business can grow and, and the momentum that it creates. That's an adrenaline rush that I don't know if I'll ever get in another experience in life. Um, and absolutely a high for us in, in building Cairn. Uh, raising capital. We raised two and a half million dollars over the course of the, the eight years. Um, almost all of it concentrated between years three and four. And uh, a special experience. Some incredible mentors, friends, uh, lifelong uh, acquaintances that I built through, through that process. Folks that uh, invested more than just their money into our business. They invested their time, their heart, their passion. Uh, folks that I'm excited and hopeful that I get the opportunity to work with again. Uh, an absolute high for us. And, and last but not least, uh, building a team. Uh, many people on our business I spent more time with on a weekly basis than I did my own family. And you, you grow to love these folks. They, they become family in their own regards. Uh, that's special and something that, you, that I think any business owner looks back on and is proud of. Over the course of that though, there's, there's definitely some lows and some challenges. For us, the perils of customer acquisition was absolutely at the top of that list. Our business thrived early on by taking advantage of uh, an, 
of the Facebook marketplace and advertising platform and Facebook not understanding the value of the mechanism that they had and us being early adopters into advertising on Facebook and riding an incredible wave. Over the course of a couple of years, Facebook figured out what they had. Facebook and Google rules the marketing world now. They are essentially attacks on businesses and until the next creative marketing channel comes around, the next new platform, it's hard. Um, there are not many businesses that are winning on the acquisition um, uh, front. Um, that was our biggest um, hurdle in continuing to grow as we built Cairn. I would say that the second challenge, or second low that I would mention is scaling back. Um, we were on such a momentous ride out of the early years that um, we grew our team and we grew our business in ways that outpaced our revenue, expecting the revenue to catch up. Scaling back a business, I think, is harder than scaling up a business. Um, it has uh, tolls on a team and tolls on individuals, relationships that are hard. And if anything, I'm as proud of how we managed those moments as we did managing the growth up. Uh, that all said, I think some of the biggest highs and lows for us came in a 60-day window not quite a year ago. Um, let me rewind the clock a little more than a year. Let's go back to the summer of 2020. Uh, a colleague of ours in the outdoor industry introduced us to an, an individual named Robin Thurston. Uh, Robin was well known in the outdoor industry for creating a business uh, called MapMy. MapMy Fitness, MapMy Run, MapMy Ride. Um, uh, sort of a second place finisher to Strava uh, in this community. I'm guessing we've got some king of the hills and queen of the hills in the room here in Strava. The MapMy business uh, was a marriage of um, the uh, social media world and fitness tracking uh, and app world. Uh, Robin uh, built an incredible platform there. He had moved on to his second business called Pocket Outdoor Media. And Pocket Outdoor Media was creating some momentum in the outdoor industry because they were aggregating, they were acquiring a lot of content-oriented businesses. Uh, businesses like Ski Magazine, Rock and Ice, Warren Miller Films, uh, Backpacker, Healthy Living, um, some name brands in our industry. And at the outset, it sort of looked like there was just a roll-up of content going on. Uh, we got on the phone with Robin, and, and, and we learned there was a lot more to that model than met the eye. Um, Robin was um, uh, focused on what Disney Plus or Netflix or Amazon Prime had done to their industry. And that was essentially creating a membership model that gave consumers a myriad of benefits where they were inspired or motivated to treat their membership as one of the most valued components of their monthly or annual budget, that they wouldn't let it go because there was just too many benefits to turn away. And his philosophy when it came to the outdoor, the active in lifestyle industry was, uh, take your, many examples here, but take your casual runner, um, somebody that embarks for the first time on running a marathon. They are setting off on a six to 12 month journey where they will consume content, they will build and track a training plan and a fitness plan or a, um, a dietary plan, they'll register for an event, they'll buy photos after an event, uh, they'll consume product along the way, uh, shoes and jerseys and, and other products. Every single one of those in our industry is its own unique relationship between the consumer and the brand. There are many touch points, there's many account creations, there's many subscriptions that have to be built in order for that customer to embark on that journey to run a marathon. His philosophy was why not create one environment, one singular membership, where for both convenience and economics, they can get everything they need through a singular platform. And when he pitched this to us and he said, you see only content today, but that's just one spoke of this wheel. There are many spokes and commerce is a spoke for us. Would you, Karen, be interested in building our entire commerce model? And as we looked at it, there were two value propositions right out of the gate. The first was, they have a massive audience. There are a lot of individuals that are flowing through their subscription base to their magazine or their website or their social media accounts. Presumably that could be the solution to one of our biggest challenges to grow, customer acquisition. We could take those customers, presumably free, and pass them through our existing services and that would balloon the business. And then second, sort of rip the roof off of, of our business and said, the sky's the limit. What do you imagine for content and commerce and the marriage between them? Most commerce businesses start off by selling product, discovering they have a traffic issue, and then starting to create content to try and drive traffic back to buy their product. They had the opposite approach to content and commerce, which was unique and something that's inspirational. They have millions of articles 
and consumers that flow through organically to read those articles? How do you appropriately inject commerce into that experience? That was an opportunity that we didn't want to turn down. That was exciting for us. So we embarked upon an LOI, a uh, letter of intent. Uh, we signed in January, uh, just after the new year, 2021. We were gonna sell the business, and we were on a 90-day journey to sell the business. I said a few minutes ago that there was a 60-day window of highs and lows. The first 30 days of that period, nothing happened. We were under contract. We couldn't go shop the deal. We couldn't talk to anyone about it, and the entire thing was confidential. Yet they missed every single deadline that they had set out to, uh, to fulfill. Uh, when documents were due, when certain points would be negotiated. Um, at this juncture, uh, the business was known as Pocket Outdoor Media. Um, they weren't sure what their long-term branding was. We were getting pretty nervous. We're 30 days into a 90-day close. We've accomplished almost nothing. My understanding is it's gonna be a challenging process. Uh, I've heard business owners speak to it before. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a rough period for business, uh, for a founder to sell. Almost nothing happens. Uh, we get to the 30-day mark, and two press releases drop within an hour of each other. The first, Pocket Outdoor Media acquires the legacy 50-year-old brand, Outside Magazine, and elevates the name Outside to be the name of the parent company. So they replace Pocket Outdoor Media, and Outside becomes the name of the core company. So at this juncture, Outside is a three-year-old startup that owns a 50-year-old magazine, and they own dozens of other brands. The second press release that dropped shortly after was an announcement that Sequoia Capital had invested a nine-figure deal into them as a startup. Sequoia is one of the most reputable um, uh, venture capital companies in the country, if not the world. We got a call from Robin. Sorry, we were busy, my response. <laughs> You're forgiven, don't do it again, or maybe do it again, but after all of this is closed. That set new stakes for the game. Uh, his comment was, we've got to close fast. Valuations are changing, there's a lot of attention coming in. How quickly can we get you into the umbrella? That embarked on the 60-day window that I mentioned of um, some tremendous highs and lows. Um, uh, I would say more than anything, it was the most challenging period of the business. Um, I felt like I was living a lie for 60 days. I couldn't tell anyone uh, about what we were going through. It was, the entire thing was a secret to everyone but uh, my business partner and my family. Um, I would say that in hindsight, what I think about, uh, I wasn't prepared for what became the most aggravating game of show me this document. Where is this document? How can you find this document? Every day was a barrage of interruptions. Someone needing some piece of information and how fast can you get it done and do it without any single person knowing that you're doing it. If it weren't for COVID, I don't know how we would have kept it a secret. And actually, I've never asked our employees. Uh, uh, maybe some of them picked up on the fact that something was odd, but the amount of time that's spent on a phone or digging through computers, it's just behavior changes. But so many people were virtual because of COVID that I think we were able to mask what was going on. Also, we were the little guy in a big guy transaction. Um, we were up against a major player, and uh, they knew it, we knew it, uh, we made some reasonable requests. If it didn't impact them, they accommodated. If it impacted them, we lost almost every negotiation. That was hard. It's hard as a business owner to be making what feels like a reasonable ex request to a company that is so large and only to be turned down for reasons that if you were to switch roles or switch seats, you'd understand. Um, but it's, it's hard when it's what you've built for so long uh, to watch uh, some things get pushed over. When we got to the finish line, a lot of people congratulated us. Uh, amazing, you sold a business. It's every entrepreneur's dream. Uh, some people said, touchdown, well done. What I honestly felt was I got tackled at the 10 yard line and drug into the end zone when the rest weren't looking. <laughs> like they really, like they really did a number to us over the course of the process and the unpredictability of it all. I was met with an, inc an incredibly, incredible surprise, excuse me, surprise by the attorneys when we were done. They said, that was the smoothest transaction we've ever done. <laughs> and I thought to myself, how does anyone survive this? It doesn't make any sense. So without dwelling too much on some of the details, maybe some recommendations to entrepreneurs in the room or anybody who's thinking about starting a business. If I were to do it again, what did I learn? What would I recommend to somebody who is embarking on their first business sale? First and foremost, if you are doing business outside of the state that you operate in, just start paying sales tax everywhere in the country. The rules are coming after you, they're changing fast. Over the course of our 60 days, I counted 50 attorneys, bankers, and accountants roll through our business and 
try and uncover everything that they could about our business, and they found one issue. That they, one issue that they brought to us and said, we're concerned. They said, you didn't pay your sales tax in Colorado. I thought, we didn't, we didn't achieve what's called nexus. Accountants will jump all over this too. Uh, in the state of Colorado, it's not a big deal. And they said, well, we're based in Colorado and the last thing we wanna do is piss anyone off here. So can you please back pay your sales tax in the state of Colorado? These rules are changing fast. If you're doing business outside of the state that you operate in, know that if your objective is to sell, it's in your best interest quickly to start figuring out your sales tax in other states and, and, and collecting and paying it. Second, keep all of your legal documents organized. It's really easy to get signatures and leave them in DocuSign. We were pretty good at this. I feel like 80 to 90% of our documents have been saved, organized, stored. I think last, uh, last month somebody dropped the F-bomb in here. I'm gonna say it was a bitch to go find the, pro the, the, um, the documents that we needed. What a pain when you have hundreds of documents to try and track down. Just store them early on in the, uh, in the right location, make them easy to find. There's three parts to selling a business. Most people, most people don't think about this. When you embark upon selling, selling a business, uh, really focus on uh, finding somebody in your business who's excellent at each of the three points. The first is the legal component, the second is the accounting, and the third is the operations. I tried to tackle all three, and it killed me. It absolutely killed me. Uh, additionally, when you need somebody, or when you find somebody that can tackle each one individually and be the point person, make sure that they're comfortable dipping into the other areas. There's a lot of people that'll step into a transaction or are specialists. Um, we had a number of uh, attorneys or accountants that really focused on specific areas. And interpreting what they said and translating it to other areas of the transaction was a real challenge. So trying to find people that could cross the line and be the, um, uh, the translator between the two is, is valuable. Fourth, luck will find its way in unpredictable ways. For us, luck came in the form of something called 1202, really nuanced section of the tax code that allows for tax-free business acquisitions. It was a miracle that we ever fell into it. The number of boxes you have to check to get into the 1202 world, nobody could ever plan for. In fact, we had an attorney in our transaction say, all the time I get businesses that come to me that are trying to stand up their, their, um, their entity with the focus on how do I create a 1202 transaction when I sell? They said, we've done dozens of these from the start. Not one of them by design has ever landed there. We landed there by luck. The attorney said, two times in my career have I ever seen a business land in a 1202 transaction. A re again, a really nuanced section of the tax code, but it, it was a big economic input um, outcome for the, for the transaction and benefit to those involved. Um, and, and last, at the end of the day, the bankers, the attorneys, the accountants, they all go away. Your relationship with whoever is buying your business is what sticks. And that's what you need to protect throughout the transaction. Uh, focus on that. What's to come for us? Uh, the, the transaction has now been closed for 10 months. We're a part of outside. Where are we going? So first and foremost, we're not physically going anywhere. We are a Ben-based business. In fact, I'm an advocate for Ben being the second headquarters for outside. Outside's headquarters is in Boulder, Colorado. I believe it's catching on, especially with um, a good chunk of a building, the, the most recent Ben Bulletin building, uh, the brick building up off of Mount Washington uh, that we've recently moved into and are building out right now for our business. I think it's gonna be a phenomenal location and, and um, spot for us to call a second headquarters. Um, in terms of where the business is headed, we are the commerce team. We are building the future of commerce for outside. Um, uh, the objective of, of outside as a whole, though, is to IPO. They're not making that secret at all. Um, they believe that they're building something quite large, something more impactful in the outdoor and recreation active lifestyle industry than has been seen ever before. And they think that in order to achieve that, going public is a big component of that. Um, Jared and I signed on for several more years through the course of the transaction, both the excitement of what they're building, the opportunity to see how a public a business goes public behind the scenes was inspiring to us. Right now, we're in very much an integration phase. Uh, outside, formerly Pocket Outdoor Media, has bought, depending on how you count, anywhere from 20 to 50 businesses. Some transactions came with multiple businesses. Um, putting that many businesses into one singular location in a three-year period creates a lot of friction. How do you integrate them all? Uh, anything from how do you run a purchase order and pay an invoice to uh, what are our terms of service? How do you update all of that? It's incredibly challenging just to figure out how to integrate it all behind the scenes and try and keep that as um, protected or quiet from the customer as possible. We're very much in that phase right now, but we are about to embark upon what we think will be a significant growth phase for our business. 
um, not just the commerce team, but the outside as, a, as an entire membership brand going forward. Membership will be the key. Um, right now there's a $99 annual Outside Plus membership that gets you access, premier benefits, to every segment of the wheel that they've built. Content is the biggest chunk, but they've, they've moved into apps, so Gaia GPS and Trail Forks is a component of what they do. Athlete Reg, not necessarily a public-facing brand, but one of the largest athlete registration, or excuse me, event registration companies in the country. Finisher Picks, when you finish an event, the, the pictures that you get that you can purchase, there's, there's a number of benefits to being a member that you get throughout this spoke and wheel. We're excited. We're also worn out, uh, is the truth of it, as entrepreneurs. Uh, having grinded on this wheel for eight years, it's, it is incredibly fun, it's incredibly challenging. Would I do it again? I think so. Uh, I think I need some time off before I do it again. A lot of people say, uh, well, so, so is that the end of the book? Where are you? And my answer to that, it's not the end of the book, but it's the end of a season. Uh, the first season was Cairn, and that season is coming to a close, but we are opening up the second season now, and starting a new season is outside, and what I think one that will be incredibly powerful for this community, and one that's very fitting for Ben to have outside here. So thank you for hearing the story, and I welcome questions. So you obviously didn't die. <laughs> But how did you get through this? How, you know, like you're an outdoor person, so was that a significant way of surviving this absolutely grueling experience? Uh, I have yet to hear a founding story that's really, or I should say an acquisition story that's really uplifting. It's usually a challenging period for any business. Um, uh, how did I get through it? Um, I would say uh, a very accommodating family, uh, incredibly supportive wife. Um, some long nights, uh, knowing that it was in the best interest of the business, the best interest of the employees, uh, that uh, it would be exciting for the community and for Bend. Uh, all of that, I would say, motivated us through it, but uh, not necessarily a window that I aspire to do again in the near future. Yeah, like, it's amazing you still have hair, Rob. Not gonna... It's not very much. <laughs> not gonna uh, lie. Yeah. Um, and your wife, Betsy, is lovely person. I'm sure this has been quite <laughs> quite the experience for you both. We first met, I think, in 2017, and at the time you were really excited, excited about the data mining and the potential to like move into membership, and I'm just wondering what's exciting you the most now? Yeah, I, I think that the, the, that marriage I mentioned earlier around content and commerce, the fact that we have an infinite amount of content and now we have to appropriately figure out how to blend commerce into it. Um, if you were to mine into my head the, the vision that I would paint for you that um, whether or not this is the, the end direction the outside goes is, is to be determined. But um, uh, imagine reading an article that you are completely enthralled in and inspired by. It's somebody that's bikepacking across Iceland. And over the course of that article as you're reading, you, there's a snippet about some product that they used. If you want to explore that, you simply hover over that component of the article, and there's something that, that comes up in the article that gives you more detail on that product. And you can either click through and go very deep on that product, or you can just add it to your cart and transact in that moment and never leave the article. And if you're a member to Outside Plus, you can receive that, that product in your home without actually paying for it and get a window where you can try it in the comfort of your own home. And only if you don't return it do you actually pay for it. That sort of consumer experience when it comes to commerce married with content is inspiring to me and I would say what I'm looking forward to the most. There were some big ambitions around our data. I think what we found was that we were early and we never quite nailed the recipe for how to monetize the data. We did some really interesting things with it. Um, uh, but uh, I think we, it was a little too early for the industry that we're in. So. Hello? Okay. Um, so interesting. I'm working for a travel health and wellness brand, and we're attempting to do something similar, but on a much smaller scale, and it is very exciting to think about like how specialized you can really get within your industry. It's very cool. Uh, big question. How's your team doing? More specifically, how are the office dogs? Did mine do? Okay. Uh, the, team's, the team's good. The team has grown a lot. Uh, when we transacted, we were 13 employees. I think today we're not quite 30. Um, so we've grown, grown quite a bit over the course of 10 months. Uh, and that's going to double again pretty quickly. Um, the office that we're building out here in Bend will house 60 to 80 people at full capacity. 
Um, but there's also a concept with outside that um, very few people are tied to a geographic location. Um, in our business, we've got some commerce specific folks that need to be here in Bend near product. Um, but overall, the company right now is six to 700 people across the, the country and, and even some internationally. And the thought is um, allow them to work wherever they're inspired to work, wherever works for their job, but give them locations that are motivated and excited to be. And I think in Bend, we've created an environment, not just at outside, but our community, where our employees want to come and they want to spend time. And having a location where they can hotel and set up their computer and dock and be inspired by their peers uh, is a real inspiration for the rest of us. So, Hello. Build a big parking lot so all those vans have somewhere to go. Right. They're coming. That's a lot of vans. That's a lot of vans. Questions for Rob? Questions for Rob? Yes. So what are your outside investors today? Losing, make, breaking even, or making money? How are they feeling? The million dollar question. Everyone wants to know the economics of the transaction. I'll give you this. We're a base hit. We were not a hydro flask. Nobody, nobody uh, hit a grand slam with this one. Um, I would say that there is an opportunity, though, with the IPO that comes. Uh, uh, there was a, uh, an election to pay it forward, if you will, and ride out this wave another couple of years. Um, but to our investors, uh, there's certainly opportunities that they could have done a lot better in, uh, and I'm sure there's some that they could have done much worse in. So, yeah. Fair. Yes. What challenges did you find in the subscription service? From my MVP question asker. Thank you, sir. Yeah, subscriptions. Uh, not quite a necessity, but incredible value add to any business. If you can find a way to marry subscription, the fact that a customer doesn't have to re-engage to transact with you is um, a multiplier when it comes to growth, um, uh, sales of your business. Um, uh, it's just incredible opportunity if you can marry it with your business model. Um, I would say that a challenge uh, in our industry, uh, which we succeeded at relative to our peers, but um, uh, relative to like a software company was, was, was quite challenging is churn rates. So uh, retention, uh, how often do customers leave and how quickly do you have to replace them? When you compare us to uh, true peers, BarkBox, Bir Birchbox, Loot Crate, the hundreds of, of the month clubs that you see advertising on your Facebook feed, our churn rate was one of the lowest we ever found. Um, as soon as you compare it to uh, the likes of Dollar Shave Club, or uh, essentially a utility subscription, uh, which Amazon has a lot of. I just need paper towels delivered every three weeks and I don't ever wanna think about it again. Um, uh, our churn rate was quite challenging. Um, so really dissecting and mining the difference between involuntary churn and voluntary churn, people that are explicitly choosing to opt out of your subscription versus those that just forget to update their credit card and then never pay attention to the emails and myriad of things that you do to try and recollect their information. Um, uh, that's something that you can spend an entire career in, if you will. So, um, uh, But I at the end of the day, I think that the existence of the subscription for us is what made us so successful. If we were a, an, a, a, an intentional transaction at every single month, I don't think we would have been nearly as successful as we were. Some killer gear from Karen over the years. Yeah, good. I still have it. It's good. all good. Yeah. Um, unique things too. Yeah. Any questions for Rob? Any other qu Yes. What's that? The name? Oh yeah, you were gonna tell us about the name. Yeah, a Karen is a rock stack. You've all seen it. Uh, you pile up a stack of rocks. Uh, it's frequently on a trail. Uh, if they're built properly, they tell you where to turn, turn around, go right, go left, continue forward. Um, more frequently, they're built as just somebody's having fun. They could be at the top of a mountain. Uh, it's sometimes built as a, you've achieved something, and, and they can be controversial. A lot of times they're built in environments that people don't want them built. Um, for us, it was uh, an inspiration. It was, you're headed on the right path, adventure awaits. It was a figure, a visible uh, mark that we felt was really valuable to tie our brand to, but we knew it would come with a challenge in terms of educating consumers on how to say it when you see it, and when you hear it, how to spell it. it is, it's a Scottish word, it comes with a heavy accent, I'm not gonna try and, and impersonate right now. 
Uh, but it is, yeah, that's the, that's the origin of the word. It's just most people don't know that a rock stack is called a cairn. Try the accent. Yeah. There, there was a good one right here. I didn't quite see where it was. Was that you? Are you okay? Yeah. That was nice. Cairn. There, you guys are way better it's than like, me. It's a little phlegmy. Yeah. <laughs> that's it's a fun question. Any other questions? Yes. Did you ever think of backing out during the challenges of the acquisition process? It was always clear to me that it was the right direction for the business. Uh, I would say for that reason, no. Uh, but I got very excited at many points about uh, the wave of relief that would come the minute the documents were signed. And I remember walking out of the room, we had announced it to our team about 24 hours before the documents were actually signed. It was very clear that it was happening regardless. And um, there was actually an all hands with the entire outside staff um, uh, I, was in a, I was in a back room signing documents while Robin's announcing it to the entire outside employee base that, that our business was joining. We were going to become the commerce arm. I remember signing the last document, walking out, and Robin's on the screen. Our entire team's around, and, and they're hearing the news. The, the rest of the organization, our, our local employees, had heard it 24 hours before. And the wave of relief that came with that was, uh, was tremendous. Uh, it felt like we had achieved and, and, and finally got to a finish line that, that, yeah, that was challenging along the way. But no, I wouldn't say we thought about backing up. Was it one of those moments where you were like, Oh my God, I just realized 20, like I have to go to the bathroom. I'm starving. Yeah. I need to yeah. call my mom. <laughs> yeah. Everything comes to you at if, once. If anything, sleep was at the top of that list. I'm just ready to sleep for a while. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Oh. Did you have much input from your original investors? We have incredible investors. There's a few in the room tonight. Uh, there's some that aren't here. Uh, I am so thankful for the guidance that they gave us over the course of the process. Um, I'll give a shout out to one in particular, Jim Collis. Uh, he was um, one of the main investors in Hydroflask uh, early on and has invo been involved in a number of deals around Bend. Uh, I would go to battle with that guy. Just an incredible asset. Talk about tough love. Uh, uh, I don't think he ever, the nicest thing he ever said to me was you're not dumb and you're not, uh, <laughs> and you're, you're not dumb and you're not um, like unmotivated. You're not lazy. So I'm not mad. You're it's not like, a complete piece of crap. Yeah. <laughs> Good job. Like, you can't like can't help but love <laughs> the experience, the seriousness, and 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 what he brings to the table. But we had I think 11 investors over the course of the business, and um, I, I think we were lucky. I hear a lot of stories of founders that end up marrying because I do think it's a marriage with an investor. I'm um, somebody that can end up being quite tough to work with, and and I think we won the lottery when it came to that. Mm, yeah. That's good to hear. Okay. Yes. This is a great question. So it's a consumer-based model. It's a subscription where you're like, just like consuming all of the things all the time. Is there anything that you're giving back to mitigate that process? Or? Yeah, great question. Uh, almost feels like I planned the question. So um, this weighed heavily on us for the first couple of years. Uh, we're injecting a lot of product out into the industry that consumers aren't necessarily asking for. Right? They didn't, they didn't request the specific products we were sending. They just want to be inspired and motivated. Um, uh, it took a couple of years to figure out the right way to do it, but we launched a program called Gear Up, Give Back, uh, 2017 or 2018. It was entirely give back, entirely charitable based. Anyone could participate in it. You didn't have to be a care caring customer in any regards, but we had an audience to market it to out of the gates. And the way that it worked was you come to our site, you fill out a short form, you get um, a print at home shipping label, no expense to you. You fill a box with whatever gear product you have, uh, good condition, bad condition. You slap the label on it, it goes here in town to the Gear Fix, one of the largest gear consignment shops in the country. Uh, if it's a soft good or it needs repair, they repair it. So um, rips, tears, zippers, um, they fix all of that. All of it would go for sale on their um, floor with special tags that could be highlighted and stand out as for charity. Every year we chose a beneficiary that would rotate year to year and all sales that came out of that program and kudos to the Gear Fix folks, they gave us an incredible um, economic arrangement on what piece they kept for their component, knowing that it was going to charity. Um, the remainder of it went to our beneficiary annually. Um, we've donated over $100,000 over the course of the last three years through that program, Recycling Gear. Thanks. Uh, I think it's a, 
it was, it was our opportunity to try and pay it forward and give back with the, not just the product that we sent that may not have been a good fit, but whatever it replaced that still had life left in it. What's exciting for me now is what can outside do with that program? You start to see all of these recycling programs. Patagonia Warnware has been around the longest, but just about every out, major outdoor brand is launching their own recycling platform. What's challenging to me about those, pro, those pla platforms or programs is they are brand specific. How many people have a closet only with Patagonia in it, no other brand? It doesn't exist. You're not gonna go to every single brand and recycle your independent gear with them. And some people will, but the majority won't. That's too challenging. Our program will take any outdoor related product through a single donation. Now you marry that with outside's audience and their content, and I think that program has a tremendous opportunity to become a cornerstone of the charity or sustainability work that outside does. We've got a lot of other things to figure out before that really takes off, but I think that the, the, the seed is planted for something big. Gearfix is gonna need a bigger space. Yeah, here it comes, Gearfix. So. Dude, kudos to Gearfix, truly yeah. an amazing business. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Okay, you're trying to get a question in. Curious about the ramp up to the IPO. Are there expectations for the team? Are there outside, outside investors? Yeah, all the things. Uh, yeah, great question. Um, I'm not privy to everything here, uh, and some of the things I'm privy to aren't necessarily for public consumption, but um, what I can share that I, I do think is really appropriate is um, membership is key. Uh, and that goes back to a question we got earlier around subscription. Uh, membership's the recurring element of the model. Um, the question is, how do you create the value proposition for the customer that's overwhelmingly significant, such that they never question it when they see once a year the $99 charge of, of outside on the credit card, the same way that they wouldn't question the $99, $119, whatever it is for Amazon Prime today. Um, so the focus for us is, how do we complement commerce and subscription in such a way that it supports the membership model? Um, outside of that, behind the scenes, it's really, how do you get this all in a state where you can go public with it? When you've got 50 different businesses all with their own books, you can't go public. Um, you've got to figure out how to concentrate and put all of that into a single deck. Um, that'll take a little bit of time to work through. But um, is there pressure? I think that there's, the pressure for us is, um, it's authentic and it's organic. How do, we, how do we become an impactful business in our industry and to the consumers that rely on the content, the commerce, the event registration, whatever it is they're looking for? How do we simplify access to the outdoors? How do we make it more inclusive? Those are the elements that I would say, the pressure, we feel the pressure. It's, it's inspiring to be in a business that had such, um, op, um, such significant um, financial or like growth objectives, but at the root of it, when you get down to what we're working on every day, it's about spending time outdoors. And that is exciting for us inside of it. We're focused on that more than anything. So. The outdoor industry is incredible. It really is, it is freaking awesome. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for coming back to Pub Talk, Rob. When are you opening an ice cream shop? When are you opening an ice cream shop? Uh, Aaron likes to joke with me about this. Uh, I, have a, I have a personal passion for ice cream, and I think this, <laughs> this town's struggling on the ice cream front. Uh, I don't know, but I promise I will tell you when I do. So I'm not sure when it's happening. TBD on the ice cream. Thank you so much, Rob. It's great to see you. I'm glad you didn't die, truly. I'm glad you made it through. You look healthy.